Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking a little bit about quantum mechanics and more specifically quantum computing. But first I have a confession to make. Even though I'm pretty familiar with computers, I'm also pretty competent with programming and even have this other channel that I haven't really posted on for quite a while, but it does involve a lot of programming and various types of computer stuff. When it comes to quantum computing, I'm still only scratching the surface and still trying to understand the basics of what the quantum computing is all about. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to work my way through this book right here and trying to understand the principles of quantum mechanics as they apply to quantum computing. And the only thing that I'm absolutely certain about so far is that what we understand as quantum computing is actually extremely different from classical computing in a sense that a typical classical computer, like the one you're probably using to watch this video right now, is able to do all sorts of different calculations and is able to solve a lot of different problems. As a matter of fact, it's usually able to solve all of the problems we usually assign to it. Quantum computing, on the other hand, is pretty much only able to solve a single problem, and usually a problem that's not really that useful, at least just yet. And for this reason, it's currently kind of misleading to call quantum computers computers. They're really not able to compute anything except for that one specific problem. And I guess the best example of this is the 2019 announcement from Google, which was all over the news last year when Google announced that they actually created something that in essence achieved what's known as quantum supremacy. In other words, a quantum computer that was able to do something much faster than a typical classical computer. But this was also a little bit misleading because the problem it was solving was specifically designed for the quantum computer itself. In other words, these types of computers are actually not going to be able to solve anything else outside of that one single problem. But despite all of this, I'm still always very excited to hear more about what these scientists are able to create. And very recently, as a matter of fact, only a few days ago from when I'm making this video, another really exciting study came out out of China claiming quantum supremacy, but this time not with some really complex and ridiculously overcomplicated designs that involve temperatures close to absolute zero and tools that would never really be able to fit in our pocket, for example, but instead use nothing more but the lasers. In other words, the Chinese scientists were able to create the most complex and actually one of the more exciting quantum computers, although I really shouldn't be calling them computers, quantum device that's able to solve one single problem, but instead of using a lot of really complex devices, it essentially used lasers and a lot and a lot of different prisms that would actually reflect these lasers. And so I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about what this device was and how all of this was achieved, because this is actually a pretty interesting discovery. And first of all, just like with other quantum computers, this device right here is only able to solve one single problem. This problem is known as Gaussian boson sampling, and it essentially was, in a sense, invented specifically to test quantum computing. In other words, by solving this problem, this computer doesn't magically become the most powerful supercomputer. It only demonstrates that quantum computing of that particular problem is definitely possible. So once again, you can't really call this any kind of a quantum supremacy because it doesn't actually create a computer itself. It only solves a problem that was designed specifically for quantum computing. And in a nutshell, the way that this problem can be explained is by imagining different types of light coming from different sources. So basically you have different types of light inputs. And on the other side, you'll have different types of outputs. And the more inputs and outputs you have, the more complicated this network becomes. And also because here we're dealing with quantum effects and not just classical effects, a single input here can actually create a lot of different possibilities compared to a single classical input that would only have two different possibilities. And so the more inputs you have, the more outputs you have, the more complex this network becomes. If you're interested in learning more about why this problem is so complex, you can check out this paper right here that explains it in a little bit more detail. But even though all of this might sound really, really complex, in reality, what this thing right here does is not very difficult to understand. And it also only relies on one major effect from quantum physics that allows it to work the way it works. So essentially, despite looking relatively complex, the functionality of this device is relatively easy to understand. It all starts with an extremely precise and powerful laser that's broken into 50 separate pieces. In other words, a single laser creates 50 different inputs. Each of these inputs are then sent to a lot of these so-called beam splitters. 
And because each of these lasers essentially contains exactly the same photons, they contain exactly the same properties such as frequency, such as polarization, such as amplitude, they essentially act as a single photon, or basically they're the same photon that just happens to be in 50 different parts. And each of these inputs then starts hitting a lot of these beam splitters that eventually create a really, really large network of different lasers. But when it comes to beam splitters, or essentially when it comes to this device right here, especially the ones where you make them 50% reflective, there's a really interesting concept that relates to them. So if you were to take this and turn this into a 50% reflective surface, a single laser coming from this direction would then have a 50% chance of going this way and a 50% chance going that way. Now the thing is, if you were to then shoot a laser from this angle and also from this angle and have both of them come at 90 degree angle, if these are basically two different lasers with two different frequencies, you once again get a 50% chance of it reflecting this way or the other way. However, there's a strange quantum effect that was discovered a few decades ago with the name Hong U Mandel effect that turns all of this into a very peculiar quantum problem. Because apparently if the two lasers coming from two directions have exactly the same properties, in other words, if we were to somehow split a laser and then have it enter from two different angles, it would then start obeying a very strange quantum effect. Instead of each laser being reflected 50% this way and the other way, they now literally combine into a single laser state and become entangled, reflecting into either one direction or the other direction. In other words, as you see in this experiment that showed this many, many times, they either reflect on the left side or reflect on the right side. They no longer split as if they were two different entities. They literally combine into a single object. But which side they decide to choose, left or right, that's essentially where the quantum effects come in. We don't actually know what side they're going to choose until we observe them, until we look at them. In other words, if you were to place these into enclosed box, and if you were to essentially never check on them until the last moment, they would be in both directions, just the same way that in the famous Schrodinger's experiment, the cat is both dead and alive, and we don't really know what state it's in until we open the box. And so now imagine the situation where you have a lot of these inputs, a lot of these lasers, each of them hitting many of these splitters at the same time, and each of them creating this extremely complex, essentially Schrodinger's box, where all of the lasers are in this perpetual left or right effect. Essentially quantum effect where you're not really sure what state they're in. And because each of these lasers creates this entangled effect at each of the beam splitters, it literally creates this really complex laser quantum computer, or quantum device that is. With the overall device containing around 100 inputs, 100 outputs, about 300 different beam splitters, and also 75 mirrors, all arranged in just the right manner to make this an extremely complex, actually the most complex quantum device ever created. With the mathematical problem being solved, being equivalent to a number that represents 1 followed by about 30 zeros. And in terms of the actual practical solutions here, according to the scientists behind this paper, if the most powerful Chinese supercomputer tried to solve the problem that was presented here, it would take uh, the computer about 2.5 billion years to complete the calculations. Whereas when using their own device, they were able to demonstrate relatively similar calculation in roughly around 200 seconds. So that's essentially the demonstration of quantum supremacy for that one particular problem. And on paper at least, it was definitely more powerful than the supercomputer created by Google. But they were solving completely different problems and they were trying to achieve completely different goals. And I guess worst of all, none of these problems are currently practical or applicable to anything we have in real life. So as of right now, all of these demonstrations are basically mathematical, they have no real functional purpose. But from the experimental perspective and from essentially being able to create this device, this is an extremely important next step in quantum computing. For example, apparently in order to set up this system, the scientists had to make sure everything was extremely accurate, up to about 10 nanometers accurate. Each of the mirrors and each of the splitters had to be positioned in just the right location. And that already means that they had to use a lot of super precise technology. And at the same time, the problem that was being solved by this uh, device is currently one of the more promising quantum problems that might have applications to other more classical types of calculations. 
And several recent papers that came out not so long ago do suggest that this type of a calculation can be used for other mathematical principles, which means that eventually we could create some kind of a way to turn this into an actual quantum computer. In other words, of all of the other computers that were demonstrated by other teams, including the team from Google, so far, this one has the most promise for being the easiest to implement for other types of calculations as well. And because it only requires lasers and mirrors and essentially splitters and can work in normal conditions that doesn't require any super cooling, this only means that of all quantum computers so far, the laser one has the most potential of one day creating some kind of a quantum supercomputer. And on top of that, because it uses lasers that can be miniaturized and can basically work in regular conditions, it does seem to be the only quantum computing technology so far that maybe one day could be miniaturized and used for normal purposes. But even though one day maybe this is actually what a typical quantum computer is going to have on the inside, at the moment we are currently lacking papers similar to this that essentially try to establish how these different quantum problems can actually be applied to, well, real life. At the moment, none of this is applicable and none of these quantum computers are going to be solving any real life problems anytime soon. So in other words, for now, all of this is just very theoretical and very mathematical. It's definitely cool on paper, it definitely sounds cool, but it's not really going to, for example, do your taxes for you. For that, you still need to have a typical classical computer. Also, I guess, a good accountant as well. But anyway, it's still a pretty cool achievement, it's still a really interesting paper and a really interesting discovery, and it also gives me another reason to try to finish that quantum mechanics book that I'm still struggling with. These are really complex effects, but interestingly, of all different types of theoretical physics, it's the quantum physics that we know the most about. As a matter of fact, a lot of the problems in, for example, space sciences, and a lot of different unusual effects we're observing will most likely be explained by some sort of unusual quantum effect we still don't understand. But anyway, we'll talk more about all of this in some of the future videos. Until then, check out the paper in the description below and also all of the other relevant studies that I mentioned in this video. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves to learn about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support the channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.